Hello, and welcome to What's the Big Idea? I'm your host, Michelle Tuck Ponder. Today's episode is brought to you by Destination Imagination, commonly referred to as DI, the leading creative problem solving program for children. Through DI's innovative project-based educational experiences, participants gain the skills that will set them up for success in careers like the one we're going to hear about today. Learn more about DI at destinationimagination.org. On today's episode, we are pleased to welcome Brian Gehring. Brian is the playwright in residence literary manager and teaching artist of the Omaha Theater Company for Young People at the Rose. He earned a BA in theater from Duke University and an MFA in theater for young audiences from the University of Texas at Austin. As a playwright, his work has been honored by the American Alliance for Theater and Education and the New Visions, New Voices workshop at the Kennedy Center. Brian is also the co-founder and co-director of the award-winning teen theater troupe, Pride Players, which uses improvisation to explore being gay, lesbian, transgender, queer, and straight allied teens. Pride Players has been honored with the Human and Civil Rights Award from the National Education Association and will begin its 23rd year this October. Joining us today from Omaha, Nebraska, Please welcome Brian Gehring. Hey, Brian. Hey, happy Monday. Happy Monday to you, too. I'm so glad you're joining us today. This is, you do very cool things. I am so lucky. I have an amazing job that makes me very happy and I can be very creative in. That is, that's, that's a wonderful thing to be able to be creative on a daily basis. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your job. So I work at a large professional children's theater. So we are about a $3 million a year theater here in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, We do professional shows on the main stage. Um, So it's professional actors, adults, usually performing for young people. We perform family audiences on the weekend, and then we have a bunch of school shows during the week. Then we have an extensive education program. So not only do we have a bunch of classes for young people from ages three to 18 to take and learn about the theater arts and musical theater and singing and dancing and acting and improv, um, but we also do an extensive partnership with the schools here in Omaha. So we actually work with um, a, a program where we'll do a theater education experience for every kid in the school and every grade will get a different experience. So they might come to the Rose and see a show or we'll go do Reader's Theater in the classroom or we'll take a touring show into the classroom or they'll come to the theater and learn about how that works. Um, And we work with every single student in over 80 schools every single year. So you get to work with differently abled kids, um, low-income kids. Uh, Tell me a little bit about about the diversity of, of the children that you work with. Oh, yeah. I mean, one thing I love about the Rose Theater is we are continuing striving to break down barriers so everyone can participate in theater. Um, So we do a lot of work um, with students um, who have autism and designing classes specifically for them in a self-contained drama classroom. And we're also doing a lot of professional development to make sure that our teaching artists are doing the best we can to serve them and help them get engaged and also have them work in some of our mainstream classes too. And of course, when we're in the classrooms, we're working with every student in the classroom there um, and really using, it's exciting to go and use theater tools because that unlocks engagement for young people to learn about history or learn about reading, get them excited about it in ways um, that they may not through other ways of teaching. So it's amazing to be, to go in and be an asset for a classroom teacher to help young people get excited about learning. That's exciting. That's great. So was there a particular moment or mentor or experience that inspired you to take the journey that you currently are, are on? Uh, at 10,000 moments and 10,000 mentors. I mean, I'm very fortunate to have had some amazing educators in my life. Um, I, I would say, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is um, I had 
an incredible music teacher in elementary school. Um, Mrs. Croft was so great about teaching instrumental music. And so I started playing saxophone in second grade. Um, and then um, I went to a magnet school for music in middle school and got to be in a jazz band. Mr. Green was an incredible jazz musician and was an incredible educator. I cut an album in sixth grade with my jazz band on vinyl. It is really exciting called Solid Time. Very proud of that moment. Um, my parents obviously were important. Um, growing up, one of the big things we had growing up was um, our family had culture points. So we had to get, I want to say like seven culture points every year. So, you know, we had choices. So if we went to go see, went to the art museum or went to go see a ballet or went to go see a musical theater, that would count as a culture point. And we had to get them, all, we had to get so many during the year. And if we said no to too many things, then by the end, our parents said, well, great. We didn't have a choice anymore. And we just have to do whatever they wanted to do for the culture points. <laughs> and my mom was really big into historical homes. And so if you said no to too many things, there'd be a lot of touring of historic homes. So, yeah. So growing up, we went to a lot of the arts and did um, went to art galleries and went to theater and went to go see um, music concerts. And so that's always been a part um, of my family growing up. Then the other two things that were really important as far as the in addition to the music and the artwork, um, I have always worked with kids in my job. So my first job was as a babysitter. I was a summer nanny. And that was in trying to engage a five and a seven year old all summer demands creativity and imagination and energy and getting them excited about things. Um, and then I worked at a sports camp for five years. That was my summer job in Houston, Texas, working outdoors at a sports camp. And I love teaching sports because I think sports really teaches about um, teamwork and about self-confidence and working together. Um, and so I love working with young people and helping them connect to others and work together towards a goal um, and get be physically active and things like that. So um, I actually didn't do well. I did theater in second grade. I was in the chorus of Annie. Thank you very much. It's You're very. Well. I, I I thought that I was auditioning for Daddy Warbucks. Um, that went to a fifth grader, but I did become one of um, the hobos um, and did a big big number there, and that was a big deal. But I didn't do theater again until I went to college. Um, I kind of wanted to do theater in high school, but between music and classes, I just didn't have time. Um, so then when I went to undergrad, I took an intro to acting class. Um, and it was, it was amazing. I was so excited. It was so creative and it was hard. It was the hardest class I took my freshman year because a lot of the skills I'd learned to be a really good student, um, it, it demanded completely different tools, um, and, and challenged me in, in exciting ways. So what did you find? Did you find a similarity between your musical performance and and your theatrical performances? What where was it? Was there any alignment? Oh, absolutely. I think. Well, first off, like the when I started doing musicals as a performer, um, I will say, oh, all my training in in music came through to me. I could read music. I knew rhythms. I knew like that I knew really well. I will also say that then in all of all the sports that I did really helped me with physical coordination, which helped me out when we started doing stage combat and started doing dancing and, and dancing really is also about rhythm and music and coordination. So those two backgrounds helped me out a lot. Um, but, but I will also say that doing music music is all about working together as an ensemble. There might be a couple of moments where you get a solo song to, you, you get to jazz and riff and do something exciting, but you're still connected to what other people are doing. I mean, like jazz improvisation on the saxophone has, is a really interesting background um, for uh, theatrical improvisation. Well, you know, something really cool about improv to me is that I'm, I'm a quilter and it, 
the, when I first heard about improvisational quilting, I thought it just meant you had a bag of scraps and you just sewed them all together and that, you know, and, and that was improvisational. <laughs> and it's real. I mean, it's really, you have to think about improv. It's not just whatever you want. And so my son is a musician. He plays the flute and he says the same thing, like how he really thinks ahead of time. If he's going to play improvisationally, he's thinking very much, where do I want to draw from here? What's going to accentuate the whole song. If I have a solo as part of a performance, you know, how does that fit in? And, and so that, that whole piece is, it's still part of teamwork though. That's the whole thing that's really cool about it is that you're, you're with acting and with music and all these things, it's still, it's still teamwork and collaboration and creativity and all that, all that stuff put together. Yeah. I, what I love about when I teach improv to young people, Mm -hmm. I think one one of the big important things is to give them some sort of structure, right? So if you say, do anything you want, it's overwhelming. But if you're like, okay, so here are your parameters. You have this amount, like here's the location, here's your character. Now play in that sandbox. That gives that structure or that foundation lets imagination um, really thrive. And it also helps the ensemble and the teamwork. It lets the actors to get playing the same sandbox. Mm-hmm. Um, within that. So we talk a lot about the, the four C's as we're talking about now with improvisation, with communication, collaboration, critical thinking and creativity. We talked a little bit about it, but how specifically do you use those skills in your work? Yeah, I, I use it all the time. I mean, that's every single day. I mean, communication. I mean, as a teacher, that's my entire job is how do I communicate to the young people so they understand a concept or they understand how we're going to do this scene um, within that. Um, as a playwright, like that, that's also my whole job is how do I get these ideas onto the play and communicate it so theaters and young people can perform it all over. As an actor, I'm communicating not only with my body, but I'm changing my voice and my imagination and like how I'm feeling and what's going on on stage Um, and collaboration. I mean, that's that's what I love about theater. That's what's so exciting is even when I'm a writer for it, which that's a lot of solitary work. But once you get into rehearsal, it is ideas from the director and ideas from the actors, ideas from designers that add into my ideas and can make it even better. So that's like. It t- makes it less scary because it's not just my work up there, but everybody's working together to do the best show possible. Um, and critical thinking is also incredibly important because if I'm directing young people, I need to be able to critically examine the work they're doing on stage um, and be able to give them notes to highlight what they're excited about, but also give them notes to strengthen their ideas. Um, and in rewriting, you need to create analyze your own work about what's working and what's not working for that. Um, right. right. <laughs> and creativity, that's what theater is. It's about using your imagination, think outside the box and, um, and communicate through theater. So you're a playwright as well. You've written scripts that are interacted, meant to go on tour, scripts for puppets. What's your creative process like? How does that where do you get ideas from and how do, how are you inspired to sit down and, and put all these pieces together? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And it depends on the project. Um, so sometimes my work at the theater, I get assigned a book to adapt. So um, for example, um, I was assigned to adapt where the red fern grows. And so my job was to read the book and figure out how to bring it up on stage. and that was a case where the two main um, it's all about, you know, getting your first dogs and, and working really hard to get those dogs and and the life of those dogs. And so, uh, so I, I was really excited about using puppetry in that because I thought that was the best way to express that um, within that. Um, And then like I had to write a Sherlock Holmes um, adaptation. And so I, I read, I read every single Sherlock Holmes book that's out there to find all the short stories and then find the hook that helped me tell it to a young audience within that. Um, other times I get, um, sometimes my plays are started by an educational objective. For example, I recently was commissioned to write a play by a bank because they want to teach fourth graders about financial literacy. 
It was let's teach about math through theater, which, which is great. Cause I think everybody needs to learn basics of financial literacy and, and how to budget. So the first step is to have to understand, well, what is the fourth grade level of that? What, what math are they trying to learn? And then, and what are we trying to teach them as far as money goes? Um, and, and once I had that accomplished, I had to find an interesting way to grab their attention. So they don't just zone out and go, Oh, math. So, um, we, so I turned it into a film noir detective agency. So silver cash is a fifth grader detective who helps fourth graders solve their money problems. I'm within that. So is interactive and the kids had to solve the problems. Um, so yeah. And then other times I get ideas from working with young people and like, like classes that I'm teaching that they're really excited about or ideas that they are passionate about. And I go, Oh, that's an interesting way to try and bring them on stage. Wow. That, that is very cool. It's also being able to figure out what fifth graders and fourth graders are, are into at any, any particular time, what they're going to be interested in. So so this is a great conversation. We're going to step away for a moment and take a break and we'll be right back with what's the big idea. Are you brand new to Destination Imagination and ready to learn more? Join us for an introductory webinar. These 45-minute information sessions are designed for parents, educators, and volunteers who are ready to learn the basics of DI and how to get started. Sign up to attend a complimentary live session online or download the captioned video on demand. Register today at destinationimagination.org slash the big idea. Welcome back to What's the Big Idea? I'm Michelle Tuck Ponder, and I'm here with our guest, Brian Gehring. Brian, we were talking about when the break uh, started about writing plays. And I guess one of the questions I want to ask is, what was the most difficult um, play or, or piece that you've written that maybe you got in the middle and said, where am I going? Or why did I take this on? What's been your biggest challenge? That's tough because I find that in the middle of every single project I've done, I've had a moment of what the heck am I doing? This is a disaster. This is never going to work. I uh, let me pull out all my hair, Um, which again goes back into where collaboration comes in. And so that's why I have a great director or somebody I can work with to give me ideas on how to flip it. Um, I feel that every project I've done has had a different challenge. Um, (laughs) One time I had to adapt a book called Miss Bindergarten. It's all about a collie dog kindergarten teacher getting her 26 students excited about the first day of school. But I only had a cast of six and I couldn't cut the characters because each student represented a different letter of the alphabet. (laughs) So um, that, that was a really hard one to figure out how we're going to do all those quick changes. Um, um, I turned it into uh, what's exciting to me about theater, as opposed to like, I love to explore what makes theater unique and what makes it um, exciting. And so in this world of Netflix and YouTube videos and movies that can do such different things than theater can, what theater can do better than anything else is the interactive live moment. So it was after the hundredth day of kindergarten and all the parents were invited in um, to do like the open house. So Miss Bindergarten was introducing and all the students would come out and present something for that. So that way the other students could rotate in and out to be the different characters within that. Oh. Um, um, so, but that's the exciting thing is like some projects work really great and are exciting and, um, and some are, Okay, and they work fine, but it's about being creative and finding new ways to solve problems and try different things. Absolutely, and you've clearly tried tried different things with Pride Players. Um, what was the inspiration behind forming this group? And with a project that's been so successful and accomplished so much, what are you most proud of? Um, so I. When I was in Austin working grad school, um, one of the great things about Austin is Austin has a queer outreach center for youth. So they have an open community center and they had support groups and they had 
they, they did the, the prom, they did movie nights. Um, so I started for two years, I led a drama group there um, that met every Wednesday night. Um, and it wasn't geared towards performance. It's just like a drama class to explore different issues and stuff. Um, and it was great. And then when I left, they were kind of itching to do a full show, but we didn't have, um, we didn't have the space for that. Um, so when I moved to Omaha, one of my job duties is to direct in the teen theater program. So at the Rose, we have an incredible program that we do six shows a year for teens and by teens. Mm -hmm. And it's completely, completely free to participate in. So, um, anyway, so I had to choose a project to work on and I said, Oh, well, let me go ahead and continue, um, do continuity of the work I was doing in, in Austin and do work, um, here in Omaha towards a performance. Um, and of course, you know, 23 years ago when we started, there were not very many plays written about what it meant to be gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, uh, any of those things, there are very few plays that were, existed already. And if they did, his experience was like to be in New York or LA, you know, the big cities, which Omaha is just very different. So, um, so I, I, so Tracy Iverson started the group with me um, and she uh, is, was a really big proponent of the young people creating their own theater, devising their own theater and using improv to create their own words. So the first year we, so we do a whole bunch of different scenes. We might bring up the topic of coming out or might talk about homophobic language in schools or things like that. And then the students, their job is to create a short scene parody song inspired by that. Um, and the point of it is we'll create, uh, you know, like 80 different scenes during our creation period. And then as directors, we'll choose like the 15 to 20 that are the strongest and then really refine and re rehearse those. Um, so I, I did it because I, if, if you look at queer youth, they just have a lot higher at risk factors as far as dealing with mental health issues, dealing um, with suicide, dealing with substance abuse, dealing with um, just school safety. And so anything I could do to help provide safety for them and community for them and providing them an outlet to share their truths and their stories to a larger audience um, was really important to me as as a human, right? I mean, I, I'm very excited in my job, not only do I personally get to be creative and do fun things, but I also feel that the work we're doing is making a difference in our community, whether it is I'm teaching a young person, helping them with self-confidence or creating a platform for queer youth to talk to parents and talk to teachers and talk to administrators about some of the issues going on, um, or even just talking to other um, activists, uh, you know, adult volunteers are doing a lot of work with Glisten or PFLAG and inspiring them to keep doing this work. That's, that is so important, you know? So we say in Pride Players, our goal is to educate the audience about important issues, to entertain them, to make sure that they are enjoying it and want to keep coming back and don't feel like they're being punished for all the mistakes that are out there, but also inspire them to make a change, right? So if, if there's a teenager who, who comes because they know somebody in the cast and they change some of their language that they use because they had never thought about it, that's amazing change that we've inspired, right? Or if it causes parents to have conversations with their young people about what's happening in the schools, that's amazing. Or if that's just inspiring a teacher who's doing great work to keep doing that great work and feel good about it and feel that this is really important work and celebrate that and to be thanked for that, that's also incredible too. Um, so it's supposed to be a one-year project and now we're going into our 23rd year, which is incredible for us. Um, and I, I mean, what am I most proud of? Um, I am proud of all of the young people who've come through the program and the, their ability to be leaders at that age. 
um, and be creative and find ways to make a difference in the community at so such a young age is inspiring to me. And they give me so much joy and motivation to keep doing my work. So, uh, and, and then when they leave my program, they do incredible, amazing, great things. How, it's 23 years in, if you look at the cohort of, of young people that you started with and the cohort that you're working with today, have you seen a difference in the kids? Are they more confident and outspoken because the change in society? Like what differences have you seen, if any? Oh, yeah, it's um, I will say that now I have a lot more. We never ask why they join pride players. Our only rule is you have to be willing to play a queer character on stage or willing to play a homophobe on stage within that. Um, but they don't have to come out as any identity. That's not that's not a requirement for the group. What I will say, though, is we have more and more students who are very openly um, queer, whatever their identity is now than, they, than it was like 23 years ago. Um, but I will also say that I think in the beginning of Pride Players, we were doing a lot more, uh, a lot of our scenes they wanted to create were a lot about being um, gay or lesbian or bisexual. And it was really about sexuality um, and creating safe spaces to bring some of the same gender to prom or dealing with um, discrimination at the workplace or fighting for gay marriage. Now, I will say it's it's exciting that so many things have changed. Um, I mean, like just with gay marriage and some of the laws and the acceptance of that. Now, what's happening a lot more in Pride Players is we're dealing a lot with gender issues about being agender or being gender fluid or being trans or using they them pronouns and the idea of fighting against the gender binary. That is, you know, if you see what's happening in the nation right now about there's so many laws being put in recently just about that are very anti-trans youth that it right now that is the population of young people within the queer community that are being attacked the most and are the most at risk. Oh, and I also want to throw out too, it's interesting within uh, our, we call our group a queer youth theater group because queer is a nice umbrella term that includes gay, bisexual, lesbian, trans, gender fluid, asexual, uh, and all of the, it's a big umbrella. It used to be a term that especially the older generations thought as a, as a, as a very hurtful word. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people in our community who are embracing it as a positive thing um, within that. So um, our groups um, are really embracing it as like, hey, we're queer youth theater and we're proud of being queer as an umbrella term to try and be as inclusive to as many people as we can. Do cis kids participate? Is mm -hmm. cisgender kids participate in your theater group as well? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we have we have many straight allies and we also have some many cis who join in. Like I like to say in Pride Players, we have three main groups who join. We have our um, our theater geeks who are addicted to theater, who do as much theater as they can. And this is just a different type of theater. They're excited to try. We have our um, our queer youth who are looking for um, community and want to have fun and just looking for a new group. Um, and then we have our activist community who are, these are the young people who want to change the world any way they can. They're, so they're also fighting for the environment and they're also um, vegan and they're also doing all these things like, oh, I'm excited of being an activist. Now, and there's many kids who have several of those identities, but that we're getting all of the entire group in, um, in Pride Players, which is exciting. That's amazing. That's, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you know, it's been delightful hearing about, hearing about you and your career and all your wonderful accomplishments, but we force all of our guests to go through a segment in our program called Rapid Fire. So are you ready? I think so. Okay. Yes or no, will robots ultimately come for your job? No. Number two, is social media the best or the worst? Both. Number three, does pineapple belong on pizza? Yes. 
As a Jersey girl, I am always gravely disappointed by that response, but we'll just let it ride. <laughs> See, we, we're accepting of all diversity and about different tastes and a, a big phrase we say at our theaters, don't yuck someone's yum. So, you know, hey, I will not put pineapple on your pizza and that is totally fine, but don't put any pepperoni on my pizza because I don't eat, I, I don't eat meat. Uh, so, you know, but is vegan pepperoni. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 I appreciate that other people enjoy that, but I don't. <laughs> Understood. Understood. It's been great having you. And I'd love to know, is there anything else you'd like for us to know before we wrap up today? You know, what I would say is anybody listening out there is, oh my gosh, try taking a theater class. Whatever community you're in, it is an amazing way to unlock your creativity and gain self-confidence and just to try something new. I, I, everybody, everybody, if you don't want to do this for a career, should try theater. I mean, try all the arts, but try theater. I love theater. Um, and if you are in the Omaha area and you are a young person or you know young people, um, Pride Players, our Information meetings for anybody who's interested are going to be um, October 19th and October 27th at the Rose. And we're performing in February. So come drop by, see Pride Players, send your teens to experience the amazingness that it is. And everybody do lots of theater. Absolutely. Absolutely. One last question. What big ideas excite you now? Um, as a creative artist, my new journey is I'm starting to write books for young people. Uh -huh. um, so that's, I've, I've spent a lot of my career adapting books into plays. And now I'm going back and taking some of my plays and turning them into books. And it's scary and exciting and a lot of hard work. And um, I'm excited about that. Um, but otherwise, what I'm, the big ideas I'm excited about is I get to work with young people and I love empowering them to tell their stories and finding a platform to share them because their ideas are so creative and they make me think and they challenge me in ways um, that uh, my adult friends don't challenge me in the same ways. So it's all about the young people and their creativity. They have some amazing big ideas, which is great. Yes. I, I agree with you 100%. And thank you so much to our guest, Brian Gehring. We would like to acknowledge that this episode of What's the Big Idea was recorded on land, originally inhabited and cultivated by the Lenape, Omaha, Ponca, and Shawnee Nations. We're grateful for this land and for the people who have stewarded it for generations. This episode was produced by Kelsey Selleck with additional material provided by Renee Rainville, and Johnny Wells, and music by Kevin McLeod. Special thanks to our guest for joining us today. You can learn more about Brian and his pride players by visiting rosetheater.org. To learn more about our show and about DI, visit us at destinationimagination.org. And if you'd like to imagine even more big ideas for young people around the world, please consider making a charitable contribution to DI at destinationimagination.org slash donate. I'm Michelle Tuck Ponder. Thanks for listening to What's the Big Idea and hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. The U.S. Department of Labor estimates that 65% of today's students will be employed in jobs that have yet to be invented. We have no way of knowing what those jobs will entail, but we do know that the skills that will prepare them for success are the skills that they develop through destination imagination. Hi, I'm Johnny Wells, Director of Education for Destination Imagination. Before joining the staff, I was a team manager for over 40 teams. Being a team manager is still one of the most rewarding experiences for me as I watched hundreds of students thrive and grow. Destination Imagination, or DI, is an international project-based competition that reinforces the four C's, creativity, communication, collaboration, and critical thinking. You probably heard about those skills in today's episode, and DI is the place where kids like yours develop those skills for themselves. 
Students work together in small teams to create solutions to an open-ended challenge. DI's team challenges fall into one of seven categories. Scientific, technical, engineering, fine arts, improvisation, service learning, or, for the younger children, early learning. A DI team selects one of these seven challenges and prepares a solution to present at a local tournament. Throughout the experience, students create projects, solve problems, build relationships, learn new concepts, and have a great time in the process. We're building the workforce of the future. Today's DI participants are tomorrow's innovators, problem solvers, and leaders. If that sounds like a good fit for you and the young people in your life, we'd love to have you join us. To get started today, visit destinationimagination.org slash learn more.